All right, everybody, thank you for coming out to the September event for the Atlantic Kubernetes Meetup. We've got a uh, pretty great uh, uh, set of speakers on deck right here. I'm excited about this one. Uh, as we always do, I want to open up the show with a call for uh, anybody who's hiring in the community. Um, if you are hiring anybody in the cloud native space, go ahead and throw it in the chat. And what we'll do is I will read those out loud after we do the news segment. Uh, please make sure to include contact information for a point of contact at the company. Um, and if, if you want to uh, add anything uh, as far as notes about it, you can always PR this into the repo. We'll also add any notes you add in chat there uh, at, at, at the end of the show as well. So any info you provide will be available. Um, with that, I'll hand off to Joe to go ahead and do the news. All right. Give me one second. All right. So um, not a lot going on this month in Kubernetes from a development perspective. Um, we did kick off the 1.20 release cycle about three weeks ago. Um, so just starting to get into the meat of it. Um, we just want to call out some 1.20 release dates to remember. There is the enhancement freeze that starts on October 6th. Uh, and then as far as the alpha release schedule goes, alpha.1 was dropped last week, alpha.2 October 13th, and alpha.3 on October 20th. And then test freeze begins uh, Monday, November 23rd. So keep those in mind if you've got any upstream contributions going or if you're waiting on features uh, for the 1.20 release, um, make sure you're following that stuff. Uh, deprecations, this is something that I felt like uh, was worthwhile to call out. The Docker shim is being deprecated uh, in the 1.20 release and will be removed permanently in the 1.22 release. For most folks using managed Kubernetes services, this won't be that big of a deal. But if you are kind of bootstrapping your own Kubernetes with something like KubeADM, you might want to pay attention to how you're building your runtime environment on your nodes. And then another call out here is for the self-hosting of the control plane in KubeADM. This has been deprecated. Uh, this was a little more interesting one. They had some call outs in the developer uh, mailing lists, but this is essentially if you're using KubeADM to bootstrap your clusters and started with the static pod hosted control plane and used the pivot subcommand of KubeADM to take the static pod manifest and convert it into uh, daemon sets or staple sets essentially running within your Kubernetes cluster. That method is going away. The um, upstream SIGs responsible for this feature set had actually downgraded it back into an alpha feature. They haven't got a lot of feedback on folks that are actually using this still, but if you are using it, be on the lookout. Uh, general Kubernetes community news from a CNCF perspective. Um, the Kubernetes steering committee elections are going on. October 6th is the deadline to vote. If you do have the rights to vote um, within the commu um, Kubernetes community org, um, please do so. Lots of great candidates out here. I link to the candidate list here. Um, and I'll let folks read through that. There's some bios and some other information of kind of like the platforms of each person running. Um, as well as a voter's guide if you're not familiar with whether or not you are eligible to vote and if you do know you're eligible to vote but you don't know what you should do, um, this link here has a lot of really good information that you walks you through the entire process, where to look for what information, how the voting is done, um, which is overall just a really cool transparent way to hold these type of elections. So. Um, we had a couple um, project uh, graduation and acceptance. Uh, Tick V um, was graduated. Uh, this is a distributed key value store type thing. There's a nice article out on the CNCF blog um, if you want to read through that. And I haven't used this project personally, but always good to see the projects make their way through the CNCF lifecycle. And then CubeEdge was accepted for incubation. Um, within CNCF. This is an interesting one as more and more stuff at companies is kind of looking towards that edge compute layer 
having some kind of first class projects within the CNCF as a guide stone of, of what to do and how to manage those things is really nice. Um, but the, the project had some really cool notable milestones for just kind of being accepted. Um, uh, but yeah, check it out if you're interested in the whole edge compute thing with Kubernetes at all. Um, good info there. Uh, this was another thing that came out. So CNCF is usually pretty good at releasing all kinds of metrics to garner information about the user base of all across all of the different CNCF projects. Uh, and they released this, which um, uh, the t concept of the technology radar isn't super new, but I do like the fact that they're going in and doing this and they're breaking it apart by kind of like high level um, genre of tool sets. So they have an observability tech radar, they have a continuous delivery tech radar, um, and overall you can look at all the different projects that are listed on here. And again, if we drill in, this just kind of breaks things down into technologies that are at a maturity level that, you know, they highly recommend to adopt um, a trial level and then an assess level um, based on like where the projects are um, new to, to fully mature. Um, but really cool if you're struggling to kind of navigate that really big CNCF landscape document with all the different tools and stuff out there. This provides a little bit more of a um, uh, centralized and straightforward approach if, if you've got something where you're just wanting to look within just telemetry or observability or something like that. Um, I hope they continue to do these and cover more categories over time. Uh, the KubeCon EU videos are all up on YouTube. I won't open that up, but uh, I've definitely been going through and enjoying being able to watch some of those things after the fact. Lots of good um, sessions out there. So if you weren't well aware, please go out there, uh, hit up those videos. Um, and hopefully by the end of the year for KubeCon North America, we'll have another set of videos to go, go from as well. Uh, another thing, kind of a little uh, fun little project that I came across for, for anybody that's super lazy with like generating YAML um, was this site, uh, k8yaml.com. Uh, it's essentially just like a, a soft WYSIWYG to generate um, uh, your Kubernetes YAML for your common deployment types or workload types. So you can do deployment, staple set, daemon set, and you can kind of walk through this little accordion wizard um, and enter your information and generate the YAML manifest for you. And then um, our good community member here in Atlanta, Shahar, uh, showed me to this, which is just a really cool uh, way to utilize Kubernetes to do non-Kubernetes things. So. This is the Cruster API. Um, it's a set of CRDs and uh, controller, I believe. Yeah, um, that allows you to uh, order Domino's pizza with Kubernetes. So if you've ever really wanted an extra way to order a Domino's pizza, now you have it. Uh, this is a game changer. I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt I, you, Joe. You know, this is that much of the, I'm going to interrupt Joe. That is amazing. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, we were talking internally with my team today that, you know, we've got to get this deployed into production. We've got to set up some Kubernetes crime jobs that schedule, you know, a weekly delivery to everybody's house. Um, there's a lot of fun that you can have with this type of thing. But I hope uh, in addition to just kind of being really neat that, you know, this, this is a perfect example of how you can leverage Kubernetes to, to build and, and orchestrate things that, that you never even thought of being technically related. I'm writing a file right now, that, uh, right now that, that, that there will be no pineapple if you order that. Piece I was about to say the example has a pineapple in it. Just saying. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is not a presidential debate. You can't just interrupt. As you Stop want. it. Listen. All right. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that sums it up um, for this month in Kubernetes. If you have anything that you feel like we left out here that you came across and thought was really cool, by all means, go out, open up a PR on the uh, Meetups repo. Um, if you need to know what that link is, hit us up in the Q and A afterwards. Um, and uh, as always, uh, reach out if you have more news for next month. Cheers, everybody.
Thank you much, Joe. I appreciate that, buddy. All right, so reading through here, we have got a couple of opportunities. Carbon Relay is looking for a head of open source. That sounds like a super cool uh, opportunity. You can reach out to Cody, who is here uh, with us right now, but you can hit him up at Cody at CarbonRelay.com. Uh, Sysdig is also looking for customer reliability engineers. Uh, like I said, the link uh, to, to these things will be posted in the show notes. So just hit those up on HackMD or we'll, we'll also post them to the meetup page uh, afterwards. Um, so next thing I just wanna say thank you to our sponsors. So I, I wanna see if I got this right, Pop. So thank you to Spontaneous Combustion Ghost Pepper Popcorn, the, the only cloud native popcorn. <laughs> that, that's actually a joke, don't sue us please. They're really not our sponsor. Uh, thank you to our, to our actual sponsor, uh, SalesLoft. They cover the uh, meetup uh, fees for us as well as the Zoom webinar fees. Couldn't do this without without uh, support of community members like them. We really appreciate it. Uh, speaking of sales, I actually should call out their hiring as well. They're looking for cloud platform engineers, and they're also looking to replace my current role at SalesLoft, the director of uh, technical operations. So if you're into technical leadership, you can hit me up. I'll connect you with the right people. You can reach me through a meetup or LinkedIn or Tech Forum for Twitter, AlexB138. I'm easy to find. Uh, and with that, we are going to move on to the people you're actually here to to uh, hear from. Uh, we have got, today we have got Mr. Uh, Stephen Tur Turena, am I pronouncing that right? Stephen Turena? Turana, you're close. Turana, I was close. All right, Stephen is the author of the Jenkins Templating Engine and an engineer at Booz Allen Hamilton and uh, our other competitor in the opposite corner wearing the gray shirt and New York cap is uh, Dan Pop Popandre, you know him, you love him, the field CTO for Cystic and host of the podcast. Uh, gentlemen, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex and Joe, for having us on. Again, big fan, you know that. Um, so are you all able to see my screen at this point? Yes, sir. Awesome. So look, Stephen and I have, you know, have worked together and kind of creating this, you know, in terms of how JTE works, how our runtime capabilities with Falco work and making these real world scenarios of the things you have to look out for from a pipeline perspective. So um, our talk today is going to be about securing your pipelines from build all the way to your postmortem using open source tools and a little touch of commercial tools. So um, I'll go ahead, you know, Stephen, you've already been introduced. This is going to be a wrestling themed cloud native. I don't think this has ever been done in the whole, you know, time is a wrestling themed cloud native uh, meetup thing. So here we go. So I would like uh, the record to reflect that I had nothing to do with that theme. Continue. Exactly. Look, Steven, like you don't have, I'll call it out. It was, it was me. All right. All right. I'm a big uh, wrestling fan. So again, we wanted to say, we're going to go right into, you know, going to these meetups. A lot of times it's slides, 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 no damn slides today. So my uncle there, Captain Lou Albano is the one who basically has said to us, there's going to be no slides. We're getting right into the heart of it, but we have to kind of, you know, set the table a little bit. So I'm going to pass it over to Steven to talk a little bit about pipelines at scale being hard. Sure. So before we dive into the tech, it's good to like understand why I've spent the past few years working on it. Um, and I'll take out all the marketing buzzwords that are usually a part of the voice track here. Pipelines are hard, right? When, you, when we talk about developing DevSecOps pipelines, you'll read a nice blog post that talks about how you're going to do a build, you're going to test something, um, and then you're going to deploy it somewhere, right? And you do that for one application, and it goes pretty okay because you could copy and paste a tutorial. Uh, and then you realize how many different kinds of testing there actually are in a pipeline, right? Just from a security perspective, you can do application dependency scanning, static code analysis, uh, container image scanning, penetration testing, fuzzing. Uh, and that doesn't include all the quality stuff, right? For, for unit tests and doing uh, functional testing and browser-based test automation, pull a word out of the dictionary and put testing on the end of it. Uh, and it can make your way, make its way into your DevSecOps pipeline. So this is my favorite meme. Um, I don't know if cursing is acceptable in the Kubernetes meetup. Okay, I'm gonna- hey, We have a up. thumbs up, Stephen. We have a thumbs up. Go ahead. Excellent, excellent. So the original meme here- Hold above the bell. <laughs> how to draw an owl. Draw a circle, draw the next circle, draw the rest of the fucking owl. <laughs> um, and that really captures how I feel that pipeline documentation for, for any tool in the industry is today, where, where the, do, the tutorials are sort of like, here's a six line file of how to do like a Maven build. And then here's how to run some tests. 
But the reality of, of building pipelines is a lot more complicated than that. Um, and that's for one app, right? And you know, you're very rarely building a pipeline for one app. I've unfortunately been a DevOps engineer building DevSecOps pipelines for 60 microservices, right? Where you've got a repo for every service uh, in the, the industry that I work, there can be multiple vendors or contractors involved in building those services. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I drew this, this pretty picture where the axes here are uh, complexity and pain. So as you scale linearly in complexity, right, you add more teams, uh, they've got more applications, the complexity and pain associated with doing that is, is exponential, right? Every, every CI CD tool in the industry today is focused on automating DevSecOps pipelines for a single application. You've got a Jenkins file in the repo that outlines what's going to happen and when, you're using GitLab, you've got a GitLab CI, it can be in the repo, you can pull it out, but then you've got to do all this parameterization uh, work. So, you know, I, I got really tired really quickly of building pipelines from scratch um, every time a new project started. Uh, I got even more tired copying and pasting that same pipeline from repo to repo and then tweaking it for a different application. Um, and that's only for one project right, where you've got a microservice-based system, let's just assume there's 50 services, I've copied and pasted 60 Jenkins files, um, and then I turn around and there's a new microservice-based system where I've got to do the same thing. So we wanted to figure out, like, how, how can this be easier? Uh, as an engineer, anytime I'm copying and pasting something, I get a visceral reaction in my stomach that tells me there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, and what we realized is that regardless of the type of app, um, when we talk about pipelines, we don't say you're gonna go do uh, like a unit test with NPM. We say like build, test, scan, deploy, uh, and then fancy other tests. So we wanted to see, can you build pipelines the same way you draw them on a whiteboard? Can you define in tool agnostic terms what the business process is to get code out the door to production um, and then be able to plug and play with what specific tool are we using to implement that step of the process, right? Some teams might use Sonar Cube for static code analysis. Other teams might use Fortify for, you know, a Java app. It might be Maven, Gradle, Ant, who knows? Um, it would be amazing if instead of having a Jenkins file in every single source code repository, if I could define in one place a common tool agnostic pipeline template that outlines the business process and then modularize implementations for which tools implement steps of that workflow. And that's what the, the Jenkins sampling engine lets you do. Uh, once we get through like two or three more slides, we'll, we'll actually show how that works and hopefully how it can make your life a lot easier if you're using Jenkins to support more than one app at a time. So this is a good segue actually, before we get into the next slide, we have a giveaway and this is from Sysdig where um, uh, Alex is, you know, I think you're gonna help facilitate this, but basically um, we have, I'm gonna pick a, basically put a number. I have a number in my head between one and, or Alex is a number between one and 10. And uh, actually between one and 20, let's go that one and 20. And uh, if you send uh, a note to Alex on what that is, it's closest to his number, then we will, you'll have. So we have three giveaways tonight. Uh, so yeah, so there's their interruption there. Did I make those rules? Like, is that a weird set of words? Should I have kind of explained that a little better? I, we have a number, Alex has a number between 120 in his head. If you guess the number, you get one of the three t-shirts and we'll go forward. That was harder than Kubernetes. Yeah, we're, I we're know, right? Kubernetes <laughs> math is hard, man. I, I I think I think I need that YAML cheat thing you sent earlier. All right, uh, all right. So I'm going to transition to Pop after the uh, the demo there, right? So like, let's say you successfully built this monstrosity of a pipeline to support a bunch of different types of apps and integrated security into everything. New CVEs come out every day. You're never safe. Um, you need to do continuous runtime security monitoring as your continuous safety blanket for the vulnerabilities that make it through the pipeline that we're gonna show later today. Uh, and there's some tools in the industry that Pop is very familiar with that can help you uh, protect your cluster even if things get through the cracks. So that was where Falco comes into play. So again, Falco is a CNCF, uh, uh, CNCF incubated project at this point, sandbox project at this point. And so the way that we're able to do that is we're tapping into the kernel at the user space level from a runtime perspective to look at your assertion and let you have uh, basically a rule set through YAML that you can then get alerted if like a runtime event happens. So later on in the demo, I'm actually going to attack one of the pods using Falco 
Um, again, that's the basis from the runtime perspective. And I'll show some, um, some more kind of enhanced use cases using our, our full uh, commercial product as well. And again, it's just to kind of illuminate where, you know, Falco can help you. We really want folks to contribute. There's some rules out of the box that you get. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, from a runtime perspective. All righty, and like I said, this is the whole idea is not only from a runtime perspective, but also this full full DevOps lifecycle where we have, you know, we've, you know, integrated from a build perspective into the run where something is running and using a runtime capability to say, okay, this thing happened in a namespace and have this, you know, enhanced context for you to understand what, exactly what's going on in your environment and then have a postmortem. So this postmortem is very important, being able to say, okay, this happened in this pod, in this cluster, uh, and I want to understand who did what even if I've stopped it, because you think about it, again, containers are ephemeral. They come and they go. They come and go based on your builds and all the things that, you know, you can do with JTE and all those types of things, right? So that's kind of the, the context for the full demo that uh, Stephen and I are going to get into. And I probably, you know, we said no slides, but now we're going to get into the actual demo part. So Steve, do you want me to stop sharing so you can share? I can share. And while, okay. I, while I switch to sharing, I like to describe Falco a different way. I'm stepping on your turf for a second. Um, How dare you? How dare you? What we like, what we love about Kubernetes or like sometimes hate is it's declarative, right? You specify what, what's the desired state and then Kubernetes and all these fancy loops that are running, make that desired state a reality. Uh, if everything's coming. When I run a container, I know exactly what that container is supposed to do, right? If it's an Nginx pod, I know the only process that should be running in there is Nginx. Um, so the power of Falco is that, I already know exactly what's supposed to happen. I can create rule profiles so that if literally anything else happens outside of what I've declared in my Docker file to kick off from a process perspective, we can be alerted or we can respond accordingly to kill that container, right? So, you know, there's zero days. Maybe there's a way to bypass Falco. That's, that's sort of the, the world we live in, but you can get to the, you know, an S3 level nines, you know, 11 nines confidence here that, Literally anything that you didn't expect to happen can alert you if you take the time to set up all of the policies from a Falco perspective. Um, so, Pop, I'm sorry that I redefined Falco, but that's from no, my perspective. You, you, that's how I think about it. And, and it's a great way to explain it. And again, the one of the things that we've kind of done beyond like, you know, the open source tool and the commercial tool is we actually have profiling capabilities. So if it does extend beyond the, you know, uh, the process is doing something it shouldn't, or it's writing to a file, we kind of learn what's going on and then we can tell you, okay, here's where you can create a new rule based on that. So yeah, you, again, very eloquently put my, my dear colleague. All right. So let's, let's talk about pipeline stuff. Um, Typically, for every single source code repository, you end up defining a, a pipeline, right? And they're not short. They're, I've, I've seen those 700 line monstrosity Jenkins files that outline every single thing that's going to happen and map the branching strategy of the development team to the, uh, to the pipeline, right? We talk about pipelines like they're linear, where you're, you're going to do build, test, scan, deploy, test again, deploy again. But the reality is not, not linear. Right. If you're a developer and you're doing all the great agile stuff, you probably have a feature branch. You probably run, want to run a different series of automated tests on a feature branch as opposed to a pull request to a development branch. And then when you merge that development branch, you probably want to do something like a deployment to dev. When you open a PR at the end of the sprint to merge into main, you might want to do the deployment to, to production. All right, so you have this orchestration between branching strategies, like how we're collaborating as a dev team in a code base to a different pipeline actions. So mapping that, that business logic of how we're collaborating on our code to the automated software delivery processes that get that code out the door to production results in very complicated pipelines. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, I hope, hopefully I can convince you it doesn't have to be that hard. So the thing to take away from, from this app, it's, this is the, the easiest app that, we've ever written. It's about 11 lines. It says, hello from Docker. Um, we have a single unit test that just makes sure that it says hello from Docker. But what we don't have is a Jenkins file, right? We don't have a pipeline definition. And that's because through the Jenkins sampling engine, we can pull that out of the source code repository in one location, just say, what is the generic uh, business process to get code out the door to production? So if we, if we read this, 
right? In parallel, I want to run unit tests and static code analysis. I don't care what tools are going to do that. I don't care if you're going to run a Maven command or Gradle or if you're going to run PyTest like we are in this demo. Um, I don't care if you're using Fortify or SonarCube or Checkmarks or Slot Bugs um, for application dependency scanning. We're going to use OWASP dependency checker today, but it could also be like talking to Nexus firewall and lifecycle, talking to Black Duck or Artifact or X-Ray. Um, we're going to build something that could be a container. This is a Kubernetes meetup. Um, it could also be a jar that I'm going to SCP to a server somewhere, um, or it could be a static bundle of, of S3 of files that we're going to put in S3 for our front end. Um, then we're going to deploy to production. Um, deploy to, I don't care if you're using Helm or Customize or Scaffold or if you're using Ansible. I know that we want to do a deployment. Um, and then in parallel, we want to run penetration testing or accessibility compliance scan. So the, the point of that diatribe was to say that this exact same pipeline template can be used across multiple teams and that could mean multiple microservices, but it could also literally mean multiple development teams within your organization to standardize on what software delivery looks like uh, within your organization while still having the flexibility to choose the right tools for the job. Right, so let's, let's see how that's actually possible. So we have our pipeline template. Instead of defining in Jenkins a specific uh, source code repository for where to find the Jenkins file for every single app, it's really hard to type and talk at the same time. Um, I'm going to grab my Jenkins password while I do this. I expose Jenkins through port forwarding, so you can't hack me. At least this is the security talk, and that's, that's what I'm going to stick with. Um, so here we've got a multi-branch project. The other, I'm going to dive into the weeds because this is a meetup and not a, not a pitch to customers. So if you, if you have a pipeline definition and a branch in your repo, which branch do you update the pipeline on? Right, like over time, no one gets the pipeline right the first try. Like you wanna change the business process or you wanna add a new tool, change a configuration. Which branch do you do that on? Because now you've gotta propagate that change throughout every branch so that it represents uh, the change regardless of where you are in the code base, uh, which is a, a separate minor inconvenience. So that, you know, a separate benefit of being able to just pull the Jenkins file out of the repo to a central location. So here I can just specify we're going to use the Jenkins templating engine. Uh, down here, I can specify where do I find my pipeline configuration. Um, so pipeline configurations in the Jenkins templating engine sort of implement what this template means, right? We have this awesome pipeline template. It doesn't call out specific tools. So we need a way to say uh, what tools are going to be used to actually perform these steps. So alongside the pipeline template, you get a pipeline configuration file. Uh, and this is going to read a lot like your tech stack. For the sake of this demo, there's one pipeline configuration file, but in reality, you can have as many as you want. Uh, you can create hierarchical pipeline configurations, sort of like you have hierarchical organizations, or maybe you have centralized policies around code quality or security that everyone needs to inherit, right? There's a huge difference between uh, a mandate coming out that everyone needs to implement container image scanning. And then you relying on every single team to actually go implement container image scanning in their pipeline versus being able to say, we have an organizationally approved DevSecOps pipeline that does container image scanning, but you get to tell me what build tool you're going to use, right? So through JTE and through hierarchical pipeline configurations, you can consolidate common configurations, uh, define them in Jenkins as folder properties, right? So we use folders in Jenkins to create the, the organizational hierarchy. So depending on how you organize your jobs, they can inherit different sets of configuration. So for some teams, you might be super strict and say, you're using this template and this is your pipeline configuration. Uh, please just write code and we'll tell you if it sucks or not. But for other teams that maybe aren't uh, like mission critical and you know, maybe they're just getting started, you can turn the governance down a bit and say, bring your own template. You know, you're just getting started. Uh, you can provide your own pipeline libraries. So the level of governance and how permissive or strict you're going to be is extremely tolerable. And there's some rules around uh, how that aggregation happens that controls exactly what the application teams are able to customize. So if we take a look at what's actually in this config file, the first is uh, allow SCM Jenkins files false. 
So here I'm just saying, like, I don't care if you brought a Jenkins file with you, you're not allowed to use it. Um, the next block is libraries. So this is where you're gonna tell the framework, what tools are we using to actually implement this pipeline? Um, SDP stands for the Solutions Delivery Platform. So the Jenkins Templing Engine is the uh, core of Booz Allen's open source DevSecOps approach that we call the Solutions Delivery Platform. We have a centralized library that has some helpers that the others uh, implement. We use containers as runtime environments for all the other steps. There's no, I've been in environments where there's like three versions of Java and three versions of Maven and Ant, and it's, it's pretty painful. So it's nice to not have to install all of those tools on Jenkins directly. We've got a container image that has the dependencies needed for each step of the pipeline. Um, GitHub, so GitHub is going to allow us to do uh, like branching strategy logic if we wanted to. Um, I didn't show that in this example template, but I can if you're interested of, you can, you can write templates to say things like on pull request to develop, run these sets of activities, on emerge to develop, run these other sets of activities. Um, PyTest, our unit test step comes from Python. Uh, OWASP dependency check, we're gonna use OWASP dependency checker to do uh, application dependency scanning. Docker, here's the, the registry where we're gonna push the container image that we build uh, Kubernetes, Zap, Lighthouse. So we've got. Can, can I add an anecdotal thing here, Stephen? Just because I, you know, I see Make me talking really to, happy. you know, I've seen customers that basically string along different parts of the world of their meaning, like the security teams, the DevOps teams. They all have these different places to, like, you know, update their, you know, their templates and whatnot. This is a framework that allows you to kind of tap this in and then ensure, ensure structure across, like, uniting the teams. Which, again, as we all know true like good DevOps and cloud native teams are essentially it's, it's culture that drives, you know, application deployments in a, in a good way versus, you know, having it like, even though you can have the best code in the world, but if you're not, you know, as a culture adhering to having kind of this, this kind of simpatico way of deploying out applications, having templates like you see here, this is the, the magic, magic bullet to doing that. Thanks, Pop. And I'm, I'm super happy to dive into the weeds of like what any of these specific libraries do. But the important part is that you can pass configuration options into these libraries. The pipeline code you write in there, it's the exact same pipeline code you would have written before. Just modularized in a way that now you don't have to hard code each pipeline to the tech stack that it's using. You can use a common template or set of templates and you can change the pipeline configuration to plug and play with what tools are gonna implement that. Um, in the template, we said deploy to prod. JTE has application environments. So if you've got environmental context that you need to encapsulate things like, I use a different Kubernetes server for dev versus prod, or you know, here's an IP address for uh, different app environments. Uh, you can define those dynamically. We'll auto wire a variable called prod that you can use in your libraries. Um, what this starts to look like over time is here's our docs for the libraries that we have. Uh, they do a lot of DevOps things, they're cool. But what's, what's more important is that as an organization, right, instead of everyone building their own pipelines, you can start building a, a common portfolio of reusable steps that everyone's contributing to. And then you can have documentation for, this is the library. These are the steps that are contributed by the library when you load it. And then these are all of the configuration options that are available to you if you want to manipulate how this library performs. Um, there's no reason every DevOps engineer in your organization should Google Sonar Cube and Jenkins and find the 15 lines of code it takes to do that analysis. Um, we can reuse pipeline code so that we can configure our pipelines instead of build them from scratch. Um, and if over time you need new configuration options, just open a PR and update the library. There's no reason for each team to be doing this themselves from scratch. So we've seen some pretty significant like acceleration in how quickly we can do pipeline development. What well, used to take five months for a new team to learn Jenkins and Kubernetes and SonarCube and, you know, the 74 other tools that are involved in the pipeline, they can now load these libraries and write their pipeline template in tool agnostic ways. And now they've got a pipeline that's inherited by every new microservice that they add or every new team that needs to be onboarded. Um, so tying this back to security, there's a lot of, there's a lot of security testing that you should incorporate along the way, our libraries archive the reports, we can open those up just to see what they look like. Um, I'm a little biased. I'm a lot more interested in the framework of being able to build tool agnostic pipeline templates, but to make sure that, you know, I'm not lying and these are actually doing things. 
we can take a look at the results. Um, I don't care about XML. Uh, the report.html, so these are our PyTest results, our unit test passed, that's great. Um, OWASP dependency checker. So this is really important from an auditability standpoint. Uh, most security teams don't trust the pipeline, which makes sense because they usually didn't help build it, right? So when you start thinking about your DevOps pipeline as your organization's watering hole, for where all the different stakeholders come together to, to make software delivery happen, there's no reason outside of culture and resistance that the security team can't help build the pipeline libraries that integrate with the security tools to make sure their requirements are reflected in the pipeline and then contribute to the pipeline configuration in a way that now it's being inherited by every single team. So that's a huge culture shift where now you have a common framework to coalesce around or you can still be distributed. Different teams can use different tools. They can configure the pipeline however they want to. But now you have a mechanism where like everyone's not doing it from scratch anymore. Um, so again, the, the benefits that I try to leave folks with to this approach are organizational governance. Uh, you don't actually know that everyone is following the same process unless you've defined one pipeline. Uh, developers have access to that Jenkins file most of the time. What's stopping them from just skipping all the tests and deploying straight to production um, besides goodwill. There's optimizing pipeline code reuse. Let's stop doing this from scratch all the time. There's a better way. If we've been doing these best practices in software development for a long time, uh, it's time they finally made their way over to pipeline development where we can separate the business logic from our pipelines from the actual technical implementation of what step is going to be implemented by which tool. And then pipeline maintainability. Uh, if you want to update the pipeline and the pipeline's been defined in 60 repos, that means opening 60 PRs or worse, coordinating with 60 teams to try to orchestrate that change. Um, and that's a huge, you know, operational overhead that slows down your ability to continuously improve. So in my experience, it's been a lot easier to manage a set of centrally managed pipeline templates and a set of inner or open source pipeline libraries. Uh, so that people can, can use them as building blocks to build their pipelines. So I, it's made my life a lot easier. Hopefully some of these pain points resonate. If you've tried to build pipelines at scale for, you know, more than five or so teams and run into some of these challenges. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Pop to say that, to show how, let's say vulnerabilities made it past Sonar Cube and LS Dependency Checker and Nexus Firewall and pen testing through Zap but there's still vulnerabilities, how are you gonna protect your cluster from, from those threats? So take it away, Pop. Thank you, I think Steven. I'm supposed to say we're arm wrestling or something. What's the rest yeah, well, of the Yeah, well, I'm tag you in. Let me tag me in, boom, got it. All right, excellent. That was a good sound effect. Can you stop sharing for a sec? I would Thank love to. You. Fantastic. So again, we talk about, you know, Falco and what this is, is what I'm going to do is I'm going to install this on a cluster that Steven and I, so the same cluster that Steven uh, deployed the, uh, uh, the deployed, uh, you know, the, the pipeline ca capability here. So if we do get your pods here, uh, oops, K, E, I'm just going to install Falco right now using Helm. And so again, you notice, you know, Eldon who, who, who won with the figuring out its eBPF. So this is a GKE cluster using cause. And so we're tapping into the functions of eBPF to be able to do, you know, have um, Falco uh, installed here. So I'm going to do that right now. And there we go. So we'll do K get pods in this Falco namespace. And we can see that this is running. There we go. That was a simple way to get us up and running and going here. Now in my other window here, are you all able to see this? Okay. And to be clear, if Pop can install something, anyone can. Right, you are. There's wait, wait. Are, ding, you're doing ding, the, ding, are you doing the are you doing the charisma stuff now? Come on, man. Let, let me let me get in here and pretend like I'm technical. All right. So so basically, right here, I have Goldberg, which was by the way in the Atlanta Georgia Dome won the championship against Hulk Hogan. This was 1990 1997. Everyone, you all know that. That was going to be the next question that Elwin uh, we would have stumped Eldon on. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and create this name suit. This is just a simple, um, uh, this is just a simple uh, busy box, you know, very simple pod that we're going to deploy here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and just show some, some, some of this. So let's go ahead and let's go create dash F Goldberg. 
Let's get your pods. I'm doing this. Okay, listen, I'm doing this in the in the cluster in the same namespace. It's probably up, not appropriate for me to do that, but you know we're friends here. So let me just do O wide and see where this is running. Oops. So we can see this is running on this here. It's running on the D down here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to K logs for the same one, which is the H. I'll go SQ. Oops, let's do logs dash F. And so what's happening here is again, we have this Falco rule set where you're able to like look at this and say, okay, there's a sensitive mount. And though these are all rule sets that you have output to that show you the context of which something happens. So I'm just gonna exec into that pod and I'm gonna run like the X, you know, one of the rule sets is if I see um, netcat running in that container, I wanna get notified of it. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go into the Goldberg. Uh, here and again, I'm using a deprecated command. All right, don't go, don't go getting out angry with me, but I'm doing it. So I'm executing into the pod. Oops, it's an sh here, and you can see. Look at that on the right side, left side. You notice it showed me a shell was spawned. See how immediate that was. That's giving me the information of shell was spawned exactly which pod this happened on. You could take this output and send it to, you know, uh, you can output it as gRPC. You can output it as as uh, uh, you know HTML, JSON, all of those types of things. So there's outputs, and we do that in the falco.org page for you to be able to see that. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to run netcat in here. So netcat l8080. You see that? Notice the network tool was launched into the container. You see how immediate that was in the left side. So here's the context that you have. So if you look at our you know our page in terms of our rule set here. Uh, you can see there's a rule set all based on this syntax. And what it is, is there's macros to do certain things like open it. Somebody opens a directory that's tied into a macro for a system call, like an exec call or those types of things. Right? So I have this immediate response of uh, that's the basis for that runtime capability. Now what you can do, and then you can extend this capability again, you know, this is for your runtime stuff, but let's just say I wanted to have the, the whole kit and caboodle and go to this, you know, this idea here where I need something for vulnerability management. Again, I have Steven's Jenkins, Jen, uh, Jen, you know, uh, Jenkins template engine working. And you saw that he had a pipeline capability for Cystic Secure, which is the full kind of overall product. So I can do something like look at my vulnerability and configuration keep details, look at metrics and details from a run perspective, because guess what? Visibility is necessary for security. You, you know, being able to see here's when this process is running in the environment and then this postmortem. So again, you saw that we had that log that showed us exactly, you know, what went on, but now I want to get even deeper. I want to figure out when I did this, what did they do? Because the container is no longer there. Let's just say that as an example. So let's go ahead and look at that. I'm going to walk you through a scenario here. So out of the box here, again, this is a, where we're, we're using the runtime capability, but we're also adding build and, and postmortem. So I have a scenario where I have an image uh, scanning, you know, capability where I have, you know, a default policy. So again, if I've went ahead and, and, and done a deployment and I have, let's just say port 22 open, maybe I want to stop that build. So from that perspective, what I can do is here's a Jenkins build again, very similar to what, you know, Steven deployed where I can say, okay, well, it, the build failed. Well, the reason why is because Again, we have the Docker, you know, there's exposed ports in my Docker build there if I tried to deploy that. So port 22 is open. So we can also do this via admission controllers as well. We all got a separate this. demo where we, we set up a, a pipeline that defines all these policies as code. So the second you get notifications, you can merge a pull request updating your policies on the cluster. And then JT can turn around and Jenkins can turn around and apply that immediately to your cluster. Um, so this is your daily reminder to as code, all the things. Hey. So this is recent. I'm sorry, is there a question? Yeah, real quick. So it looked like you have your kind of own um, policy definition, um, like language or framework there for the Falco policies. Do you support anything like open policy agents, Rego or anything like that as well? Uh, no, we don't. So basically, again, there's a distinction between like, you know, OPA and, and Falco. Falco is this behavioral rules engine, you know, based on our own kind of syntax. And that's, you know, freely documented here. So if you want to look at our rule sets and fi files here, you can see exactly how they're done, how kind of the conditions are for outputs. So these are all based on like file descriptor classes and all of those. So we have a link in the, in the slides here to be able to define that. But I mean, there's linkage you can do with OPA, for instance, from an emissions controller perspective. And those are things we're actively pursuing. I'll leave it at that. 
So from that perspective, the other thing that we're doing that's interesting, this is just in a release that we just did, and I really want to call this out, is to be able to create Falco rules based on CloudTrail events. So something like detecting a user using MFA in the environment, we're able to easily kind of position that within a single UI versus you having to go to CloudTrail and then going to another place for you to see, you know, Falco rule violations or even vulnerability management, like vulner vulnerable images and those type of things. So I'm going to show you an example where somebody launched that network tool the same way that we did it before where I'm going to go to the activity. And this is where, again, Falco rules is, you know, what we do is we're trying to do is to enhance the experience because from a runtime perspective, if you're understanding how to create these rule sets, that's great, but maybe you want to kind of make it more, more easier. And so we're tying this into things like, you know, cloud trail integrations or specific Kubernetes events. So you can tap into the cube audit trail to be able to like create a rule set. So let's just say Alex created a namespace and I want to kind of control that and say, no, I don't want to allow Alex to create a namespace. Even though I really do, I think he's, he's pretty good at this stuff. So I think he'd be all right, right? So basically I have all of these rules. And if you've noticed, these are the same rules that you're seeing that's part of this file, but we've enhanced it and we can then set context. So I can apply this rule set here and say from a runtime policies perspective, okay, somebody terminal shelled into a container, right? And if they terminaled into the container, I can stop the container if that happens. So there's kind of action that happens or create a capture, which is every single system call. So think about this from a postmortem perspective. I can get every single system call that happens so I can do a postmortem of what of uh, forensic capability. So let's go back to the event here. So we see here somebody terminal shelled into a container. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over. Let me do the, the network tool. So I go here and I look at this in activity. This is, you see there's this spike here. So they spiked in. And I see all of these Apache bench processes that are happening at the same time. So what I can do with this is very simply take this and filter out every AB request because that's a normal set of traffic. But we can see, all right, somebody actually went in and launched AB 10,000 times. Wow, why did they do that? And again, I want to talk to you all about the fact that you can basically take this we have that suspicious network tool here. This is why visibility is so necessary for you to do security here, where I can take this and go, well, what, how many net, what was my net request count at that given point in time? So let me look at my network request count for the day. You see that spike there? Uh-oh, well, which pod did this happen on? Boom. This is where I can look at the pod name and this is telling me, okay, there's this pod name and this is what, and that storefront that this happened on. And then I can do this. I can look at the process this happened on. Could I figure out which user did it and then do public shaming? So I could uh, shame some employees for you sure shooting in prod. <laughs> you sure can. And again, this is a demo environment. Look at the UID, right? It's right there. It's telling us exactly the PID, the shell process, the TTY that it happened on. So think about that increase. And then you could take this and enrich your SIM with all of this data. Good, 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 good setup question. I didn't prepare you for that. I wasn't prepared for that one, Steven. Nice, nice, bud. So hey, Paul, <clears throat> how, how does this tie back to the open source software? So exactly what I mentioned earlier is basically from a runtime perspective, these rule sets are being created, right? And you can basically, all of these rules that, that are being set here are all Falco rules that you can do this from a runtime perspective. So you can enhance what we're doing here. I'll give you a good example. We, you know, we basically have this, these rule sets that people are enhancing all the time. So like MITRE ATT&CK framework was created using like, you know, somebody, some, somebody put it from an open source perspective. Uh, Brad Giesman found a actual kind of uh, a vulnerability capability within, you know, using our, our tool and he, was, he enhanced it to be able to look for a specific set of cont container vulnerabilities and whitelisting capability. So again, that's where we're kind of taking that and enhancing and putting in that in, in our um, that we're putting that in our, in our tool. So does that answer your question, Cody? Well, I already knew the answer, but yes, it did. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for feeding me that one. <laughs> so the last thing I want to show you all is again, the, this example of one, one more rule set here where I can basically take this, you know, rules, the same rules engine that we, we, you saw that example I did with Falco out of the box where I can take this, this runtime policy and say, I'm going to show you this one. So basically there's an activity that happened and, and somebody terminaled into this container. So that is a rule set that's built into Falco that I can do some cool things with. And again, you have the context. I have the container. Think about this. If I have, 
a hundred clusters and I want to get to the, the bottom line of which cluster this happened on. This is this cluster name and all of that. We go back to activity. You see there's a gun, again, a spike here. And this is all based on, again, that open source, you know, capability of the rule, the rule sets that we have using Falco. So now I can filter just when they exec and I, you know, remember Steven, you asked earlier, I can publicly shame service account terminal shell and container that person. I can publicly shame them right now. They bashed in and I have all the context here. They were in this working directory. They LS and they curled. So I have this data. And then I can even take a capture. So this is a capture that happened 20 seconds before, or 10 seconds before the event and, 10, and 20 seconds after. So my workflow is again, I, th I have this event, I can see the activity that happens. And if I want to do even more forensics, I can do this. So remember there's this, this 25 second of uh, duration here. It happened at this, the 10 second mark. They ran some commands here. Uh, sorry, this is a incorrect capture. Let me go to the correct one. It's almost like distributed tracing for continuous runtime security, right? Like it's not very helpful to see one event. It's, it's very helpful to be able to see the entire, every syscall across your entire cluster or set of clusters that correspond with a particular event. And then feeding these findings. I have, you know, a very large investment bank and they're feeding these findings to data science to be able to say, okay, I'm correlating this down to this web and this cluster with this pod. And these are happening on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to do that. So again, tying this into a pipeline as well, like, you know, you'd be able to take these rule sets. And like Steven said earlier, he has an integration that's with JTE where you can take a Terraform and update these policies on the fly. So you can actually do it, uh, you know, rules as code. So here's the, the commands themselves. We can see they curled in. Again, this is the power of eBPF and visibility here to be able to say this happened in this container. And by the way, this Sysdig inspect is open source right now. So you could take Falco rules, create captures and do what I'm doing here. What the commercial tool is puts this into one full workflow. So you can have a complete dev set, secure DevOps workflow from build all the way to postmortem, like I showed. So this thing happened. And then again, the container is no longer there. They wrote out these files to the file system. And this was the install script that they used. So if I click here, I can see, you know, the, the, the contents of the, of course, in here, oops. I can see, uh, where is it, the install script. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah, so, all right, let me just see the content of the readme right now. And again, the container is no longer there. We recreated this, recreated this through system calls. One more thing I wanna show you before I, I hand it back over. I'm, I, how am I doing on time? Do I have a couple minutes, fellas? All right, so, the other thing we do is we can actually natively integrate with PSPs, right? To be able to do some cool things here. So what we can do here is actually, let me talk about this first. We, are, we also do compliance. So we're doing, the agent is actually doing a compliance check on the hosts themselves. So as we know, being able to do host compliance and be able to see like a CIS benchmark for the hosts that are running these contain over, you know, multiple clouds is really useful. So I can look at this and I can schedule, for instance, a Docker bench, cube bench, or even Linux host. And I could say, okay, maybe I just want to test for etcd controls or something like this, or, you know, like some of the, the API server pod specifications are six, you know, 644. So maybe they should be, a, you know, more restrictive. So I can do that within the context of, of Cystic Secure. Very cool stuff. And again, all of this runtime capability that I showed you, all of those things are all tied into Falco is the engine for all these things. Our open source tools are the engines for the commercial side. All these things that you all can contribute and you can use out of the box right now. One other thing I want to show you here is this is a very cool capability that we have is enacting, um, in, enacting pod security policies are inherently difficult. You know, and so like I know, you know, there's, there's policies that, that, that are out there is be able to say, okay, if I apply this to my workload, we can actually tap into the cube audit log to be able to say, if I applied this rule against X, Y, Z um, namespace, this is the violation that will occur. So basically this shows you, if I do do this, if I try to apply this to the metal LB workload, you know, and, and namespace, this would occur. So I can exclude this rule set. One last piece. We can even do image profiling. So again, that example where 
you can use Falco out of the box right now. And you can do it exactly what Steven said earlier in that, like from a runtime perspective, you can guarantee that like, you know, I can create this rule set and lock it down even further. But what I can do with this is basically we're doing learnings about specific, you know, uh, containers here. So we can say if a process, for instance, is detected and it's outside of the scope, we can actually create a rule set here. So we can say if somebody is doing something outside of this, it actually learns and you can create a policy on this where this is basically this process that's happening and I can apply this to a specific namespace or a specific cluster. Super useful because then instead of you having to create all these rules, it proactively learns what's going on. And if a container something deviates, this would create a runtime policy on the fly for you. That's my spiel here. I'm gonna go ahead and kind of go back to the deck for a couple of things. So, uh, Stephen, do we want to talk? Do you want to talk about the? Um, this is the last uh, slide here. So, do you want to talk about kind of where they can get more details here, on your side? Yeah, sure. Everything's open source that you saw today. Uh, JT is a Jenkins plugin, just like anything else. Uh, we're currently working on a 2.0 release that's going to drop in October. So, I'm excited for that. There's a whole ton of docs I've spent more time writing than I like to talk about. So feel free to read them. So I know that someone has. There's some learning labs there if you want to get started. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out. We've got Gator channels and all, all the things. Uh, so if you've got any questions, I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, I'm going to ask you all to take a look at falco.org uh, right now. Play around. Again, you saw how simple it was for me to install our agent. Um, you know, to be, excuse me, to install Falco and to be able to, you through, through Helm. So, you know, very simple for me to add rules. I can, in the Falco rule set, I, you know, in the Helm chart for deployment, I can basically define my own set of rules if I want to. So you can kind of get, install this on Minikube if you need to, to be able to kick the tires on it. The other thing is if you want to look at the full commercial tool, we're offering a 14 day trial so you can kick the tires on that as well. Uh, so you can do all the capabilities I showed. So basically this whole workflow all the way from build all the way to postmortem, all these top five essential workflows for securing your workloads are already available to you uh, with, uh, with Sysdig. I see there's a ton of questions. I'm going to stop sharing, see if we can answer some of them. Did we wow them that much? We got everybody speechless? I mean, come on, Toronto. <laughs> I've got tons of questions for you, but I, you know, I want to give, give our, uh, the community here an opportunity to, to grill you before I do. I wasn't part of this. You weren't supposed to be able to grill me, dude. Well, I'm always, I'm like a, a gas. I can fill time no matter what. <laughs> uh, so how, this is a genuine question. Like, how do I get started? If I don't know anything about container security, what is the best way to go about like building these rules profiles? Is it, I don't want to answer for you, but is it like Falco hub or there are best practices that I should be implementing? How do I get started? So look, we have, we just wrote an amazing doc document. That's literally like the essential workflows for securing, you know, Kubernetes in general. And that includes image scanning all the way to kind of compliance, all the way to runtime capabilities. So those are the things there. Out of the box from a runtime perspective, the rule sets that you get with Falco are our best practices based on the community come back and creating these rules, right? So that's the first and foremost. Um, in terms of, like I said, Falco should always be a kind of entryway into like runtime capabilities. Now, if you need the full gamut all the way from build to postmortem, sign up for a trial, 14 days, kick the ties under understand that and you know again we write a ton of blogs on securing these things just you know uh, we you know we we have one blog that we wrote that that was you know specific to securing like openshift for instance and you know that's very well regarded you know because it has all those capabilities of not only the containers themselves but the underlying components those underlying components are the ones that we see a lot of people doing violations to i mean if you looked at Great example, uh, Ian Coldwater and Brad Giesman, they talked, you know, they created this K3S implementation. They were able to go in through the API to be able to introspect all, you know, all the underlying components to be able to really, you know, do a number on the, on the, on the cluster that was there. And so these, these are the things is you can have a tool that's going to do vulnerability and container manage, you know, vulnerability manager from a container perspective, but having it scan the underlying components is vital. You need to have that full kind of reach, but also the postmortem with, you know, runtime and postmortem as well. 
we think we're the again we're the, we're the most one of the most holistic solutions out there. Thank you. And, you know, and I would just like to add, <clears throat> coming up to speed on writing Falco rules, it, it, it really isn't rocket science. It's super easy. I mean, if you could learn Bash, you could write a Falco rule. <clears throat> and they have uh, really good resources out there. And they also have a public Falco channel. I don't know if it's on the public GitHub Slack or in the Kubernetes Slack, but they're, they're, it's on the Kubernetes Slack. Yeah. And they're, so, like, they're talking in there every day. And if yeah, you, so I, let's say if you, if you want to, you know, uh, go ahead and, you know, take a rule set and, 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 and kind of you know, contribute, you can do that. And, and like Cody said, we're, all, we're always, we're always checking Slack. I mean, Nova's in there. We have three of probably the best EBPF people in the world with uh, Leo and Lorenzo, Leo Grasso. They're just phen phenomenal, phenomenal resources. Yeah, what I was going to add is that like, it sounds super intimidating, right? That you're basically writing middleware to intercept sys calls with eBPF, but the query language that you use to write these rules makes it really accessible. So you got, you know, the Falco team that's done a great job making this an accessible tool to be able to do things that like, I'm a scrub, I could never go write eBPF rules to, to validate these things. So Falco is awesome. It looks like uh, real quick, a little further up in chat, Bailey po uh, posted a question that they said they're studying for uh, their degree right now. It sounds like they're uh, newer to the industry and they ask if there's any certifications you all would suggest uh, studying for if you're new to this kind of stuff. Steven, uh, is more learned, look, Steve, Steven is more learned than I. Go ahead, my friend, all you. Yeah, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say the certified Kubernetes administrator. Uh, I like that a lot because it's, it's hands-on, right? There's a lot of certs that I'm not gonna name any that uh, you know, a multiple choice test, you can memorize stuff and get through. If you get the CKA and I see that on a resume as someone that, you know, does a lot of interviewing, I know that you actually know what you're talking about. So CKA is one that I recommend to everyone that I work with. Um, there's CKAD, the certified Kubernetes uh, application developer. So I, I think it depends on what type of role you're looking for. If you're like an end user of the cluster or looking to be an administrator of a cluster, if you're really focused on security, there's a new cert coming out around uh, Kubernetes and security. Um, I could keep going, but that's probably a good, good amount. Like the, what, one thing I do tell everyone is that if you know Linux, you know everything. So like the Red Hat certified, uh, you know, systems administrator, containers are just fancy Linux. So if you know Linux, you know everything. Um, so that's, that's worth taking. I don't have it because I'm scared of it, but I would recommend that you get it. I mean, just hands on again, ha hands on with Linux administration. When I took my CKA, it was, you know, it's very much, you know, having to, you know, figure out things with, you know, system D and all of those things, right? Journal CTL. I mean, there's a lot of that happening. Uh, one of the things also, uh, Gary Hutchins is, who's one of the SEs at, at Sysdig mentioned this, and it's a really good resource. We have security hub dot, uh, dot dev excellent resource. Thank you, Gary. That basically is, you know, for, you know, folks that has out of the box solutions for like actual rule sets that have been contributed that you can, you can install through Helm for things like, you know, Nginx or even, you know, applications. So you don't have to like build your own rules. There's a, you know, there's a the community's already contributing these rule sets and we're seeing, a, you know, a lot more adoption from that perspective. You're, you're in the t-shirt. Wait a second, Gary, you already have your own t-shirt. <laughs> All right, folks, unless we get any other questions. Anybody else got anything? Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Pop and Steven. We really appreciate it. Always welcome back. We love we love this stuff. Thank you so much for coming out and chat with us. Thanks for uh, having up us. Next, thank you yeah. very much. Uh, up next, we've got a personal friend of mine, a guy I, I spent a while working with and really always enjoyed spending time with, uh, Mr. Tim Dore, uh, founder at Spaceship, a local Atlanta software company, is coming to talk to us about cloud native build packs. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, I apologize for all the antics over the years, but uh, <laughs> yep. <clears throat> uh, Water under the bridge. Yeah. Let me see if I can get the right method of doing this. Uh, yep. Cool. So that should be sharing. So um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, cloud native build packs. Um, with kind of the subtitle of never write a Docker file again. I'll get into what that means um, in just a sec. But to kind of go over me first, um, so I am actually a founder at SalesLoft where Alex works. Um, and uh, I've been an entrepreneur and technologist in Atlanta for a long time. Um, 
if you know me from my open source contributions, it's from my work on uh, Redux or React Router. I'm a maintainer on both of those um, frameworks on the front end side of things. Uh, I'm also pretty weird. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what I'm working on right now is at a company called Spaceship. And we're actually using build packs as kind of one of our uh, two core tenants um, along with Kubernetes. So it's like Kubernetes plus build packs makes a spaceship. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit at the end. Um, but just to show like this is a thing that you can actually use to like build stuff for real, it's not a toy. Um, kind of want to go over uh, just at a high level, like what a build pack does. So a build pack just all it does is analyzes code, source code that you've written, um, and then turns that into a container image. But it does it completely automatically, meaning there is zero configuration you need to do. You don't need to write some sort of file in some esoteric language. Uh, sorry, not uh, throwing shade against the, uh, the Jenkins stuff. But um, th there's no need to write any configuration whatsoever. So, um, and there is nothing that comes out of it other than a uh, container image. So um, you basically just shove code in, container image is out, and magic happens in between. Um, and I'll explain a little bit of like what that magic is in a bit. Um, <clears throat> to kind of go over like where these even come from in the first place. Uh, so if you're familiar with Heroku, uh, then you've used build packs. That, that's actually where this comes from originally. Um, the, uh, the original technology was born at Heroku themselves, um, kind of the V1 version of, of build packs, which is uh, much more internal and bespoke and custom tool. Um, kind of as they grew and they added more languages, they became more of a polyglot platform. Uh, originally, they were very focused on Ruby as their language of choice. Uh, Ruby on Rails being kind of like the up and comer at the time. Um, I think this is back in 2011, 2012, somewhere around there. Um, as they moved to a, more of a polygon platform, they developed a, a, a kind of version of build packs, which is much more pluggable, um, supported all the different languages, but also could plug into different languages and frameworks as well. Um, in addition to a bunch of other cool stuff I'll get into in a sec. Um, kind of at the same time, Pivotal, uh, had this uh, product called Cloud Foundry, uh, there's a company called Cloud Foundry, um, who developed a parallel implementation of build packs. Um, wasn't based on anything that um, Heroku had uh, written themselves, but it was implementing a lot of the same kind of unofficial standards for how build packs operate. Um, and then they both realized that they're wasting a lot of time building the exact same thing over and over. Um, and in the, you know, DevOps space in particular and the operations space, we had uh, the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation kind of come to be. Um, and they joined up uh, underneath the CNCF, uh, I think it was about two and a half years ago, uh, so early 2018. Um, and they uh, came together to create a standard for what these things should be. Um, so that's been incubating in the CNCF. Uh, I believe it's still a sandbox product uh, project. Yeah. Um, so it, it's still at uh, Sandbox State, it's still pre 1.0, but they're planning on getting to 1.0, uh, I think still this year, uh, if not early next year. Um, and they, they've kind of created a standard um, you know, specification for what a build pack is and what all the components that go into build packs and how they operate um, are, um, and a kind of set of reference tools and reference implementations of those things. Um, although it is an open standard, um, and what has happened is companies like Google um, have taken that specification and produced their own versions of these things. Um, and even like uh, Cloud Foundry is now split out and has a, a separate uh, build pack project that's completely open called um, Paketo, um, P-A-K-E-T-O, um, that is implementing build packs um, yet again um, separate from the previous efforts by um, Pivotal and Cloud Foundry um, to create a, a new platform for them. Um, those are written in Go. Um, Heroku is written in Ruby for the most part, um, although with a bit of Go now. Um, it's kind of interesting to see this stuff evolve. So, um, you know, what does that actually mean? Like, what, what can you do with a build pack? Um, and the answer is pretty much anything. Um, you can 
any language, every language. I cannot think of a language that is not supported by this other than ones that are not like intended to be run as applications. Anything that anything language is intended to be run as application can turn into a um, into a container image using build packs. So anything that has a, any sort of build steps, you know, you have to install dependencies or compile some files um, or run some sort of build step, um, whatever that is, uh, can do that. In addition, they could do a bunch of other things around that. Um, so they can install system libraries. So if you require, uh, you know, a particular database client to be installed on the system level that you then compile into your application, they can do that for you um, ahead of your application getting uh, compiled directly. Um, they can also add in additional uh, code or executables um, into the resultant image so that you can bring along essentially like sidecar like. Um, you know, what you normally have is like a sidecar container, um, but directly inside that image. Um, and then you can potentially boot that separately as a separate, um, you know, container within your pod or entirely a separate pod, um, if that's what your uh, desires are. Um, there's also a launcher script that gets output in the container image. So that's kind of like the central entry point for the, um, the image. So you can modify that script to have additional functionality that maybe uh, particular build pack works or how the um, uh, system that surrounds your code works. Um, and it even does things like supporting monorepos, which is actually very interesting because it's essentially saying uh, I'm taking this build, build pack and like multiplexing it out to so, you know, if I have a monorepo with say like a Ruby project and a Node.js project in it, I can separately run those to the same build pack. Um, but um, you know, it's going to run the node specific stuff in the node code. It's going to run the Ruby specific stuff in the Ruby code. Um, and those things will be, um, handled separately, but within the same build pack step. Um, so again, what, what do you kind of get out of it? Like what's the end result? Obviously an OCI compliant image, um, so you can run it anywhere that you can run Docker. So obviously Kubernetes is an obvious choice for that. Um, and then, uh, what's interesting is like the way to actually compile these things together. So it's com compiling a series of layers, you know, typical Docker stuff. Um, but for each um, build pack that runs against it, so when you run a build pack itself, you're actually running several uh, potential build packs that can run against that um, particular um, bit of code. Um, I'll get into the specifics of what it's doing there. But um, uh, everything is kind of layered on top of this. Uh, you start with a run image which is your, think of it like the operating system or your, your from line at the very top of your Docker file. So that might be um, most of the Docker, most of the build packs nowadays use uh, Ubuntu 18 at the moment. Um, so, you know, you have like a, essentially a from Ubuntu 18 um, at the top of your Docker file, that's the run image here. Um, and then the build packs will layer on top of that, any kind of output that comes out of that. So if you have a, um, a Ruby build pack, it'll do the Ruby specific stuff, whatever needs to happen. In this case, like you know, bundling gems um, and running maybe a Rails asset precompile um, if that's part of your application. Um, and then we'll spit that out as a separate layer. Um, if you have additional build packs that are doing additional things on top of that, they'll spit out as separate layers. Um, and what's actually very cool about having this separate layer for your, uh, your from line essentially is one thing that they can do that's very uh, interesting and actually relevant to uh, what Pop and Steven were just talking about is you can swap out that run image, meaning you can essentially upgrade the operating system in place. You don't require to rebuild the application, but if you have security updates that are applied on the operating system level, those can be put into place with the existing uh, layers that come above it um, and you can rebase them as it's called um, so you get the exact same output in terms of a, a runnable container, um, but without having to rebuild it um, entirely. So you can take one single run image update, apply it across many uh, in one go without like a bunch of rebuilds, uh, which is really powerful um, for maintaining a secure um, environment to run your code within. Um, in terms of how it actually is running, so this is kind of the visual I pulled off their site. Um, everything is packed up into a 
uh, a builder image. So um, the actual build process for build packs happens inside of Docker itself um, and writes back to the Docker uh, port. <clears throat> and you basically take your app code and then um, in the builder image is the base you know, build image for that um, environment where you're actually gonna run the code. Um, what's called the life cycle, which is essentially the tooling to manage the process of running build packs. Um, and then each individual build pack that you're gonna support. Um, I'll show a demo in a bit with the Heroku build packs and that includes build packs for uh, you know, Ruby, Node.js, Python, Go, um, anything that Heroku supports, uh, at least officially, is already pre-bundled into there. Um, and then you can optionally bring in additional build packs. So you can even write your own. So if you have a, a language that's not yet supported by, say, the Heroku build packs uh, builder image, um, you can add that into the system on top of that. Um, and again, these are all just layers on top of each other. So building on the uh, semantics and tools of Docker itself, uh, which is really cool. We're not like reinventing the wheel here. We're using a lot of existing technologies to make this happen. Um, I guess internally within the build pack itself, and it's kind of helpful to know this stuff, although it's a little bit of uh, inside baseball. <coughs> so a build pack itself is made up of essentially just three things at a minimum. Um, you know, a build pack toml file, which is just your metadata, you know, what is this build pack called? Um, you know, what does it do? Uh, does it depend on anything? You know, the general metadata about like what should be done to, um, and then two scripts that are just key to it. So you have detect and build. Detect is uh, going to be run on, uh, every single build pack that's in the builder image is gonna run detect. And you know, all its job is to do is to say like, am I applicable to this coder? So if it's a Ruby um, build pack, during the detect line, it's going to look for something obvious like a gem file. Um, or if it's a Node.js project, it's going to look for the package JSON. Um, it's going to look for signals that say, like, this has uh, within it relevant code to what I'm doing. And um, that will just cite that the lifecycle uses that to detect the, like, okay, should I actually build using this build pack or should I just skip it? You know, if I have a bunch of Ruby code and the Go build pack says no, obviously no point in running that. Um, and then the build, bin build script is like kind of the meat and potatoes of everything. It's where all the, the magic happens. Um, so, you know, it's the thing that's doing um, in the case of either Paquetto or a lot of Heroku's build packs, this is kind of like an entry point to a much larger system that's going to do detection of things like not just the language, but also potentially frameworks that you might have, even versions of those frameworks that uh, might be relevant. So like with the uh, Ruby build pack for Heroku, um, it has detections for like which version of, of Ruby you're using and then therefore which things should we do specific to each version. Um, and then the same for Rails where it's gonna do like slightly different things for like an older version of Rails like Rails 2 um, versus like Rails 6, which are very different projects um, and have different tooling that's kind of evolved over time. So um, it can kind of fork out and do those things. And, you know, again, these are just like scripts. So they can be written in whatever language you want, um, as long as it's executable within the build image. And uh, they can uh, do essentially whatever the hell you want. Um, they're kind of, um, it, there's no like framework or anything for how these things have to be um, behave. There's a specification as to like, you know, what exit codes they return, what output they return. Um, and kind of what things they can leave around the system for other build packs to pick up on or the life cycle to pick up on. Um, you know, one key thing there is the ability to say, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the thing that was popularized over at Heroku is this concept of a proc file, which is a, a series of processes you can run out of my application. So I've got one application code base and I might have a web server on it. It might have a worker process. Um, it might have a scheduler. Um, we might have a bunch of different things um, within that one code base. And I want to say, like, I want to run the web process, I want to run the worker process, I want to run the scheduling process. Um, and it lets you define as an output, like I've detected these potential processes within the system. Um, and then those all get amalgamated together. So you have, um, you know, whatever all the build packs collectively set are the processes that comes out. 
So th this is the kind of thing that can come out of a build pack um, in addition to what can go into it. Um, so let's get over to a demo. Um, let me make sure I can get this actually working. Stop for a sec. Get back to my... So is this all readable for everyone? Can they, everyone see this? Uh, just thumbs up, I guess. Cool. I just want to make sure it's, that's actually readable. So what I've got here is a very, very, very simple um, <laughs> Ruby project. Uh, it's literally just a hello Gates ATL project. So if I actually run this, um, uh, you'll just have to trust me, but it, it's, uh, here, let me curl. Cool. Um, it prints out the thing I said to print out. So um, I want to turn this into a container image, but I don't want to write any document. Um, there is a kind of reference tool, but it's, it's a fully capable tool uh, called PAC that comes out of the BuildPAX project. So um, PAC by itself has a bunch of subcommands. The kind of key one that we're looking at is build. So build is going to let us uh, take a, this code run the build packs I've defined against it. Um, I've set a default builder, um, although there are, um, uh, there are a number of other ones um, that are kind of built in and bundled. Again, Google's got one set, and then Paquetto is kind of Cloud Foundry's now official offering um, that you can use. So I can, set any of these as my default. I've set the Heroku one in this case uh, because they have um, Ruby support built in. And um, I can just go ahead and start building. So um, just to kind of look at my Docker setup real quick, um, I have previously run this before, but I cleared everything else out. So I have no images. I'm not basing this on anything um, that exists within my Docker system. But um, if I build and then I specify a name of the image I want to produce, um, I can start a build process. What it's going to do is it's going to download the uh, uh, builder image. It's going to run that build pack. So uh, I'll have to scroll back because that was really fast. Um, and one thing that's really nice about this system is it'll implement caching for you as well. So these things will get progressively faster as you go, uh, which is obviously really helpful. So what I've detected here, uh, at the, in the detecting phase, that's when it's running bin slash detect. Um, Heroku Ruby has said, yep, me. And then uh, the proc file one has also said, yep, me. It's kind of a default one that just always runs. And if I provided a proc file, it would produce output processes that are in that proc file. Um, I did done a quick analyze just to make sure I've got the, um, if I got a previous image or not, restore it if necessary. And then the building actually happened. So, um, again, if you use Heroku, this is literally the exact same build pack code that runs every time you get pushed to Heroku. Um, it, it is no different. There's a, a small shim layer called CNB shim, uh, cloud native build pack shim, um, that gets the Heroku specific build packs translated over to the specification of cloud native build packs. And um, you can see it's doing a lot of the same things you'd see there. So it's, um, you know, detecting a particular uh, gem file lock, a version of bundler, um, a particular Ruby version, um, which I've all specified in this gem file. So I've specified 271 as my Ruby version. I've got one particular gem in there. I need to actually boot this up. Um, some temporary crap because of bundler updates. And then <laughs> the actual bundle install. So this is me downloading dependencies that this project needs. Um, again, I didn't instruct it to do this necessarily. It just detected that the file was there. It knows what to do with that file, uh, which is run bundle install within this uh, build image, and then uh, does some other stuff to detect kinds of processes that exist. So it's detecting if there's any rake tasks. Rake is a, a task runner tool for um, Ruby if you're not familiar, um, and it's detecting if there is a, a rake file is the, the term there. Um, that has a definition of tasks in it. Um, and in this case, because I have not defined a proc file or a rake file or anything detectable, it has no concept of any processes. Um, but the kind of like default handler for everything with this is to, uh, you know, show the, uh, just run the, the rack process essentially. Um, 
at the end, it spits out a bunch of stuff. So it adds some um, layers to the uh, particular image, and then I get a built image. So um, now, in my images, I've got uh, Kate's ATL, my latest version. Um, there's actually, I think, a, no, maybe not right now. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a cache image at the moment because I don't rerun it. But um, I can actually run this now. So, so now it's running inside of Docker. Um, again, this could be Kubernetes or whatever. And then, well, there it is. It's running. Um, and then I can take and do other projects of different types. So I can um, get out, kill it here. Um, So I've now got some uh, node stuff in here. Let me get this out of the way. So uh, the simplest way I can make it non-detectable is just change the name. It's going to look for a gem file. If I call underscore gem file, it's not going to find it. Um, and I've moved some stuff back into here. So now the uh, Node.js uh, uh, build pack will run in its place. And you can see it found, um, hmm, I don't know why it's running the Amoeba one, but it's in there. <laughs> Uh, Node.js engine, Node.js yarn, proc file again. Um, it's doing all the usual uh, Node.js stuff and yarny stuff. So I spit that out at the end of the day. Again, back to another image. Um, there's my cache image from last time. And uh, you can see these are reasonably sized. You can probably get it lower with a smaller run image. Um, and there are a number of ways to, you can specify a specific run image you want to use. So you might be able to um, find and build one around, like say Alpine or Distroless or something with smaller uh, amounts of, uh, you know, run image layer data. Um, but I can run this again, with almost the exact same configuration as last time. Uh, there's a Node.js app and I can curl from it. Uh, I don't have Google at the end, so that comes out weird and you can see the request on this side of things. So um, simple as that. Um, I could then take and push this out to my, uh, my system, uh, my registry, uh, run it anywhere. Um, what's actually been very nice about using these systems um, and is basically like we even had to fight against the system. Um, it's actually been very pleasant to work with. Um, we have, haven't had any real problems with getting it going. Um, there's a really vibrant and active uh, set of Slack communities, both for build packs itself and for Paqueta. Um, so they're very active in terms of communicating out to people, uh, make sure that you can get involved um, and see what's going on with the project. Um, I cannot see for the life of me. Hey, there we go. Got some questions. Strong opinions about the project files. Want to add extra commands to your Docker file? How would these type of additions be made to build packs? So um, it depends on the build pack. Um, sometimes there is the ability to, um, you know, essentially inject uh, runtime scripts that get run during the build pack, uh, build process itself. Um, <clears throat> struggling to think of a specific example. Um, I do know that, uh, so in the Node.js universe, you have this concept of uh, scripts. So my, I have the single uh, start script, and that's how I'm actually defining for this particular build pack, that process. Um, you can actually, uh, maybe it's not seen there. I think it's just a default, uh, a fallback default. But if I define it a, uh, a build script, I believe that gets run during that build pack. Uh, I'd have to double check. Uh, it might be the case with Paquettos and not Heroes, um, or either or, I'm not really sure which one's which. But, um, Opportunity to put, put in some stuff that gets run there. Um, another common thing, at least with uh, Roku and something we're building over at Spaceship, is uh, like a release step. So something that get, gets run when this software is ready to go to the actual cluster where it's going to run. So, um, you know, maybe something that uploads the files to a CDN um, or uh, I don't know, runs migrations, um, any of the usual kind of like things that need to happen before this code actually lands in front of customers and actually lands on a running system. Um, that's another common uh, task. And that, that's outside the scope of build packs, 
although it's something that can be exposed from the build pack in terms of a runnable process. Um, something that comes out of uh, the default, if you have like a more complex Rails app, uh, which I don't have here, um, where you have like a, a console, uh, one of the tasks that gets spit out automatically is a console task. So I can start up my, um, my container with an arg of console and it will run that specific task. Um, and that will spit out at the end of the day, a Rails console. I can start typing in stuff into an interactive REPL and issue commands and um, you know, whatever the heck I want to do there. Um, and that's from the built image. So it's using all the tooling, all the versions of stuff I'm, I'm expecting, um, the same as any other uh, you know, container that's running in my cluster uh, with that same version of the image. Um, and I think that's it for questions. Um, let me back to my slides real quick because I have a fun one. Um, not a stupid one, but I um, just want to talk really briefly because I, I have one chance to talk about the spaceship. Uh, so <clears throat> we are currently in early access, but uh, we're actually using build packs. Again, our our thing is we're taking build packs and we're combining it with Kubernetes. So we're trying to produce a, but where the hell you want to host it. So um, we are completely agnostic about what cloud run, um, you know, what basement it's running in. As long as it speaks Kubernetes, that's all I care about. <coughs> um, you can't actually enter your credit card number and don't worry, but you can enter your email address, which may be equally valuable to you. So um, choose wisely, but uh, we would prefer it if you go sign up, uh, get on our early access list. Uh, we are onboarding um, develop our design partners, we call them right now, um, kind of our early customers. Um, we're planning on going wider with it uh, very soon. But um, yeah, that's my shameless plug for Spaceship the last moment. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Uh, this is probably a pretty short talk in general. Uh, but that, that again goes back to like, build packs are a very simple tool. They're not a complex thing. Um, you can get started with them really quickly, um, get a lot of value out of them really quickly. Um, one thing I found in particular is like, it's very complementary to a lot of uh, typical uh, deployment flows. So uh, one, one thing I like to say about Spaceship in particular is that like we are very complementary to um, a typical CI flow. So all the stuff that uh, Stephen was talking about in particular um, we are not looking to supplant what he's doing there. Uh, we're looking to build upon that. So, you know, once all, all that stuff has been, you know, you've run all your tests, you've validated all your security stuff, you've uh, done everything you need to do to validate this code is good to go. Um, that's when we come in. So we come in at the last possible moment because we don't want to solve all those other problems. Um, yeah, this sounds like this. I was gonna say, it sounds like the simplest possible library for JTE where it's one command, I just say pack and I get a, a built image, which yep. is a lot easier than having to reason about based upon programming languages. Yeah, um, there's another uh, project called KPack, uh, which is the essentially Kubernetes hosted um, pack, um, for lack of a better term, where it is, um, it sets up a bunch of CRDs and you create something like an image and that gets turned into a build. And then at the end of the day, you get like a actual um, URL to a uh, registry image. Um, did you, did you and, hear the news today, Tim, about like, I think it's Porter is a graduated project from CNCF. It's the CNAB stuff. Is that any, have, have any, it's like a, I guess it's a installer or something for, you know, is this kind of touch your world a little bit? Uh, I'm not super familiar with Porter. So I'd have to look at it. Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt you, man. No, no, no worries. I'll Google really quick. Uh, I see it on the landscape. Uh, it looks like a load balancer. That's what I said. So there's two CNCF projects called Porter. There's Porter LB, which is the one I was familiar with. There's also another one that it just got, I think it's just added as a sandbox project. And so what it looks like is it's an installer for application bundles. It's a CNAP. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see this one now. Um, <clears throat> just looking at it really briefly, I think it might be a separate thing. Um, yeah, it's more around like, it looks like it's around the install, the actual like getting it onto a system kind of process. Um, 
build packs are more like just going from code to container image. So not necessarily like, um, like what you do with that image after the, the fact. So, you know, in terms of resources that it might need, it might need you know, services and ingresses and certain environment variables and config maps and secrets, all that, all that jazz. Um, this is more specific to just, you know, application, the poly polyglot and all that fun stuff. Got it. Very similar to like PCF and I got it. Okay. Yeah. It's basically supplanting like any need to run like Docker build. Ever. Um, you run pack build instead. You wouldn't write a Docker file. It would just automatically do all the things that you need to do. But again, what's very nice is it's, uh, you know, if you really need something completely custom, you just write your own build pack. Um, they're really simple. They're, they're not hard at all. Um, it's again, two scripts. Um, like some of the, the simplest build packs, like the monorepo service uh, I was talking about earlier, that is like, I think like 20 lines of code in total um, for the entire build pack. It is dead simple. Um, so if you really want to start getting into customization, like the framework that build packs gives you, it's just so, so simple to use. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with it. Um, and luckily, like, you know, you have projects like Paquetto and you have Heroku's build packs that you can use as kind of your starting point. And then you can layer on top of that any additional changes or things you want to do that are completely custom and bespoke to whatever your process is. Um, and so it gets into really like customizable space in terms of how you deploy stuff um, and how you like build code. I think probably the best thing about it from just a general operations prospect uh, or perspective is like you get the exact same process every single time. Um, like I know Alex can speak to this, but like the aging of Docker files as like the repos don't get touched over time means you have things where like you have learnings and like newer Docker files. So like usually the Docker file you create for a new project is just copied from the most recent one you made. And that one has the best version of your, your Docker setup, but you have ones that, you know, that are like super old and nobody wants to touch. Um, and get turned into what I call the haunted forest, which is, you know, code nobody wants to venture into because it's scary. Um, and nobody wants to go back and fix those things. Whereas if you're using a tool like this, you know, whatever builds with it will get the latest version of your, like, um, you know, build process, at least for that specific set of build paths. Um, so they're constantly getting updated. Uh, really good thing about, uh, so that, I was talking about KPAC, which lives in uh, Kubernetes land, is that once you establish this image CRD, um, you create the, the image object in Kubernetes, it lives there long term. And what that means is if there are updates to the run image, it's going to go back through all the previous images it built um, and apply those updates doing the rebates um, to all those images automatically. And you don't have to touch it at all. As long as you leave the images around, it'll continue to update them. Uh, we actually had initially had a, a fun set of bugs with that, where we were leaving around the images and creating new images for every single um, uh, deployment we were doing. And we were, when there was a run image, we were going back and doing like hundreds of rebases all once. It was actually really fast, um, but it was still kind of uh, overhead that we didn't need to do because we only had like five apps we were doing like hundreds of these rebases. Um, but again, you can kind of make that stuff retroactively apply to your application without having the application from scratch. Um, you know, if there are, in, are internal dependencies and things within the code that do need to be updated, that's a separate concern. But, you know, all the stuff that you kind of, as a developer, don't touch or see or know about even, um, that is generally put on the operations side of things to handle, um, at least from the security and, you know, operational perspective, um, you can rest back, wrestle back some control of that because you're not having to, uh, you know, set it through an entire build process from scratch, especially one that may be ancient because it's an older Docker file and, um, you know, have to know that like, hey, we need to update all the Docker files across all of our projects that are using Ubuntu, you know, 12 or something really old. Um, you know, we have to go retroactively do that again. Um, instead, you can just have it monitored and it gets updated automatically, um, you know, for a tool that is not even 0.1 version, uh, KPAC, I think it's 0 0.9, 0 0.009. Um, it's actually pretty fully featured. Um, so it's interesting to see where they're gonna go with it. Um, but that kind of thing is 
really where like from an operator's perspective, like pack or build packs really start to show. Um, you know, you get the best like the best practices all the time, um, whether that's from the build perspective or the resulting um, container image that comes out of it, because you can swap out that runtime image. I'll stop sharing because I'm sure that set of gifts is very distracting. Uh, if I can find my mouse. Can you have custom like build pack registries? So if you end up building customized build packs, can you can those get built as an artifact? How does that work? Yeah, it's, it's um, again, it's running inside of Docker. So it's just running as a uh, typical Docker container and just has access to the Docker socket um, is writing back to that same Docker instance. So, um, you know, in Capex case, it will uh, push whatever registry you have defined for it. Um, but for, you know, a typical build like what I just did, um, I would have to uh, Docker push that on my own um, to wherever I want to go. So if okay, you're was... looking at like integrating into like a, a CI tool that has a little bit of CD in it, um, you would run like the pack tool to build the image, just the same as you would run Docker build. Um, and then the push would be happen after that. Um, so, you know, basically if you have like a Docker build line somewhere, you just swap that for pack build. Gotcha. What about like custom build packs themselves, right? So no, it's not necessarily the image that gets built, but if I build my own build pack to integrate with pack, um, is that something that you can do? And if you do build your own build pack itself to support either a new language or a custom way to go about building things, does that build pack that you customize become an artifact that you host so that all of the developers using pack can pull it? Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, again, these are just like, you know, essentially layers on like a build image at the base. So um, yeah, it's just layering those things on top so that you, um, like I, I can probably go into this as like a separate talk because there's a lot to go into here, but like building a builder image is like, it's again, it's just a Docker image. So it's wherever you, you have it, you can host it yourself internally. It doesn't have to be anything external. Um, although you can base it on like say the Heroku one um, and you uh, can layer on those customizations on top of it. Um, or you can start from scratch. You know, the, the, the nice thing about it is it's a pretty open specification and it's pretty easy to completely customly build a, a builder. Um, the uh, actually on the buildpacks.io uh, site, which is their main documentation, I definitely would encourage people to go there. Uh, let me post that in the chat because it's actually pretty useful. Um, <clears throat> they have a, a full uh, set of documentation about like building a builder itself. Um, and that's where you can really get uh, deep in the weeds in terms of really customizing this stuff to exactly what your organization wants or needs. Um, you know, you could potentially run like um, scanning tools within the build pack process itself. So you could, uh, you know, essentially you know, if you have stuff that, uh, you know, fixes common security issues automatically, you can run those during that build process um, and alter that code before it uh, comes out insecure. Um, or you can, uh, you know, you, you could block the build. It wouldn't really be advisable, but you could block the build uh, by have the, having the build pack fail um, if there is some sort of security vulnerability check that happens. Um, in general, you want that to happen in a separate CI step so you can identify it as, you know, exactly what caused it. You know, if your build fails, that can be frustrating if you just know your build failed, you didn't know exactly what happened within it. Um, so, you know, you can, but I, I probably wouldn't advise it. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um... So I think we'll put a pause on questions uh, right there. Um, and uh, just want to do a few housekeeping closing remarks type stuff, but by no means that's, you know, you don't have to leave, you don't have to go. We normally do some social hangout time afterwards, but wanted to take some time to again, thank Steven, uh, Pop, uh, super great to have you on here. Tim, really great stuff. Appreciate you coming out and sharing with the community here. Um, and that being said, you know, we've been really, really blessed this year to have some amazing speakers like those we've had today. Um, and we want to just put it out there. If anybody that's on is interested in speaking, if you have topics that you want to hear 
people talk about. Um, reach out um, either through Tech 404 Slack in the uh, Meetup Atlanta Slack channel in the official Kubernetes Slack org uh, on GitHub. Um, any of those avenues, uh, reach out to us, let us know what, what do you want to see, what do you want to hear about, who do you want to hear about it from, or, you know, as always, we love to have our own community members uh, jump up and uh, take the torch to do some presentations as well. Um, that being said, toss it over to you, Alex. Yeah, and just one more point on that, even, even beyond speakers and topics, if you have any feedback on how we can improve the meetup, uh, we're also open to hear that. We love hearing, uh, you know, anything you think we can do better. Uh, you know, this stuff doesn't work without the community. So pleasing you guys, make it, making you all happy is you know, what we're here to do. So let us know. Um, uh, so our next meetup is the uh, end of October. Pop, you're distracted. I'm watching you move your icon up in the corner there. <laughs> Catch my eye. Uh, and the next meetup is the end of October on the 28th. We have Torrin Sandal, the, the head of the uh, OPA project uh, from uh, Styra coming down to speak mm -hmm. with us. That's going to be a really good one. So definitely come out. Make sure we'll, we'll publish that on Meetup probably tomorrow. So, so make sure you go sign up so you get notifications. Great uh, company. That, Great company, y'all. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, awesome project. Um, yeah, that, you don't want to miss that one. Um, so like Joe said, we're going to go ahead and open up to social time here in a minute, but, uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Appreciate it.